Hi, I'm Madison Mary and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I have my July wrap up. So I actually had a pretty good reading month in July, especially considering it's when I like started my job and everything and moved and like literally everything in my life was going on during July. So um, I read 13 books, so like good on me. Three YA and 10 adult books. Genre wise, I read two historical romances, two urban fantasies, one historical fantasy, one contemporary, and seven romances. My total page count, which is the highest it's been since March of this year, which is really nuts, um, is 4,750 pages, yes. So as per normal, I'm gonna be starting with my lowest rated reads and waking up to my highest rated reads. Um, one quick thing though, is that I'm not actually rating one of the books and that is Green Rose Girls by Laura Pohl. The reason why I'm not reading this is just that it's a conflict of interest with the company that I currently work at. Um, but for anyone who's curious about this book, it does come out this fall and it is a kind of like fairy tale retelling book slash dark academia slash like mystery at a boarding school. And it's for fans of like Once Upon a Time meets Pretty Little Liars, but like with hella queer characters, like the entire cast is hella queer. Um, our four main characters, one of them is lesbian and deals with fibromyalgia. Another one is a biromantic demisexual and has a lot of like OCD and anxiety. Another one is aromantic asexual. And then the last one is another lesbian. So just wanted to mention that. Please check it out if it does sound interesting at all to you, but it's kind of like the grim fairy tales gone horribly, horribly wrong with like an urban fantasy twist. So my last rated read for the month of July was a three star read. And that is The River Has Teeth by Erica Waters. I was really excited for this book because I really loved um, Erica Waters' debut, which was Ghostwood Song. Now this just didn't live up to it, and I'm kind of sad because I think there was a lot of potential here, but it's a dual narrative, and I ended up just not liking one of the POVs, and that just, that really ruins the book. So this is a gothic urban fantasy book. So you're following Della and Natasha and Natasha's sister has just gone missing. She's one of a few girls who has recently gone missing on the bend. And so we then have Della and she is a witch and her family gets their power from the bend from this like woodsy forest lake area. And so Natasha goes to Della for help to try and find out what happened to her sister and Della agrees only because Della thinks that the person who is kidnapping and killing these girls is her mother because her mother performed a spell that went horribly awry and ended up turning her into a beast. And so it's a very interesting book. I really love the magic system in it. I loved Della's POV. I loved learning about all the witchy stuff kind of going on and kind of how everything really worked. It was just very interesting. I just didn't like Natasha's POV because the whole time she was like, I think it was my sister's ex-boyfriend who killed her and like he's the reason why he did all this and she was just so freaking dead set on it being this guy the entire time and she was just like I get the whole idea it was like okay she has like these anger issues and, so she, and she's like supposed to be this like super angry main character but it just I got I got sick of it very quickly I got sick of it so it just ended up being like an average three star read. It was fine. I'm still gonna check out more from America Waters the more she puts out, but this one was just a miss for me. There was also a savage romance between Natasha and Della, but you know, it was also just like an average romance too. Like it wasn't like a star takeaway from this book. The next three star read is Too Good To Be Real by Maloney Johnson. Now this book I think had a lot of potential. It just ended up being a little bit of a miss for me. I definitely wanna check out more from Maloney Johnson when she does put more books out, but this one just ended up kind of being a little bit more average to me, even though I really did appreciate. I really did appreciate that this book features a self-love scene, if you know what I mean, like a self-love, female scene. I'm winking to hope that I get the point across to you. So we are following Julia and Luke. Julia works for this magazine company. She writes listicles and stuff. It's kind of like Buzzfeed-esque and her company is going through a round of layoffs and she's like, crap, what can I do to make sure I stay? And so she ends up pitching this idea that she's going to cover this brand new resort for the company's like resort section. And the company's like, okay, if you can do this, if you can pull this off and do a really great job, we will keep you on. And she's like, okay, I got this. And the resort that she's going to is this brand new place that has opened up and it's basically a rom-com resort. You go to it 
and you are living a rom-com. It's kind of like, you know, like those murder mystery parties where you go to them and you kind of like take on a persona when you get there and like act everything out. And there's like some actors also like mixed in with like the regular people who are taking on these personas. It's like that. You go to this rom-com resort, you get given a person you're supposed to be and you like flirt around, you maybe find love, you have all these little meet cues. There are actors there to kind of like make things go along the same way. And like, she's she's really excited for it, but she's also very skeptical because she doesn't like really believe in romance, but she gets to go with her two best friends. And so it's the three of them kind of experiencing this rom-com resort. And then we have Luke and Luke is the games master, the GM of this resort meet. And so they end up hearing that, you know, there's going to be this reporter coming to write a report on their opening day. And so Luke ends up becoming like one of the people in the game to make sure that that reporter has the best, you know, experience. The only problem is they actually get it mixed up and they think that Julia's friend is the reporter, not Julia herself. And then Luke ends up finding himself falling for Julia and Julia falls for him and it's their romance. Now, one of the big issues with this is that it was very, it was very predictable. From the beginning, you can tell that the big conflict is going to be the fact that Julia is lying to him and not telling him that she's a reporter and Luke is lying to her because he's not telling her that he is actually the creator of this game alongside his sister. And so like, you know, that's obviously going to be an issue with this. Um, I think for me, the big standout to this entire book, what I loved about it was the female friendship in it. I love Julie's relationship with her two best friends. It felt so realistic. It was utterly hilarious. The way they interacted is how I interact with my friends. You know, the opening scene to this is them talking about unsolicited dick pics, which is priceless. I loved it. They were so unfiltered and I would like easily read more books about her and her friends. Like they were just great. Her and Luke's romance, it was cute. It was sweet. It was just like, you know, it was very run of the mill as a romance. Luke just like wasn't my favorite character. He just had like a lot going on. He kind of annoyed me at times and I was just like, I wasn't vibing with him. So like, I feel like that's kind of like maybe where the letdown was, but you know, there was a lot of potential here. It just, you know, I think this actually would have been a lot better as a movie, which is funny because like all the rom-coms they're acting out are, you know, movie rom-coms. So I definitely think that that could be a really awesome idea, but you know, as a book, it was fine. Then we have my 3.5 star reads, the first of which is going to be The Dating Dare by JC Lee. This could have been such a great, great book if it wasn't for the first 70 pages. It's just so sad to say the first 70 pages of this book I could see people DNFing it. I almost DNFed it within the first 70 pages. I, I was like, I, I pushed myself to get through those 70 pages and then I fell in love with it. The last two thirds of this book were so much fun. I loved them, but that first third just didn't do it for me. And that is why it's a 3.5. But we are following Tara Park and Seth Kim, who are the like best friends and brother of uh, one of the main character in the first book. But Tara runs a brewery with her family. She's really awesome. I freaking love that she's a brewmaster. She's so into what she does. And it's just like a really fun thing to read about. But she's kind of sworn off like actual relationships. She kind of just does flings and stuff like that because she had a very verbally and emotionally abusive boyfriend when she was in college. And she was like, I'm never gonna go through that again. And then we have Seth Kim and he had his heart broken a few years ago by this woman who just completely like trashed his entire career. He was a artist and photographer and she just threw him to the wolves and he has never recovered since then. He is moving in a month to go to Paris to be a professional fashion photographer. And so this opens up during the wedding of the main couple in the first book. And we have Tara and Seth who end up kind of, you know, with this like sexual attraction with one another and then they end up getting super drunk and playing truth or dare and Seth ends up daring Tara to go on four dates with him before he leaves for um, Paris and she goes fine I'll take that dare we just can't fall in love with each other during that time and that's like the whole stipulation for it so they go on these four dates and try not to fall in love with one another and of course they do they catch feelings very quickly um and I really loved them going on these dates and like having this like very sensual like instant attraction to one another they were like constantly fighting and it was fun because they were more friends in the beginning like they started off kind of like as enemies and then they quickly became like very hilarious friends and then like fell in love with one another and then were like oh no no i don't like you but they were like oh god am i liking you i can't like you and they just did like the funniest things to like purposely like bump into one another and like spend time with one another and it was just so adorable the romance was really really cute and i was just laughing because it was very pure like there i mean it was really hot and steamy but like it was very pure oh that's another thing there were like some really great like steamy foreplay and makeout scenes in this 
And then it would just be fade to black to the sex scenes. And like, normally, normally I'm like, okay, if it's fade to black, it's fade to black. But there was just so much heat, so much heat in the build up, like really steamy build up. And then it was just like, <laughs> JK. And I was like, you, this book blue balls you. This is so rude. <laughs> so rude. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. But you know, otherwise it was really fun. Like, you know, maybe I'll check out more from JC Lee, but this is just kind of run of the mill. I think that the humor in this was definitely on par for me, but yeah. Then we have a book that might come as a surprise to a lot of people and I'm so sorry, but this is only 3.5 and that is Get Alive, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. I'm so upset because this was on my five star prediction list and it wasn't, it wasn't. And it sucks because I loved our characters separately. I just didn't love them as a couple. I like them more as friends, and I think that's where the big issue came from. So in this book, we are following Chloe Brown, and she's chronically ill and has fibromyalgia, and you know, ever since she was diagnosed, she's kind of like taken a back seat. She's tried to live her life very simply, very plainly, just trying to keep herself, you know, safe from everything that goes on in life. What ends up happening is she ends up having this like near-death experience one day, and after that happens, she's like, oh my god, if I were to die right now, I wouldn't have accomplished anything. I haven't done anything in my life. What is going on? So she decides that she's going to create this list of all these things that she wants to accomplish. And one of the first things that she does is to move into her own place to get her own apartment. The only problem is that she ends up instantly butting heads with the manager of that apartment complex. His name is Redford. And they just do not get along. Until one day, Chloe and him kind of have this like coming to terms of like being amicable people together. And after that, Chloe is like, actually, I could really use your help completing some of these items on my list. One of them is to ride a motorcycle. And I know that you have a motorcycle. And he's like, I mean, yeah, I guess I could help you out. And she's like, okay, but I don't want you to like be in my debt or anything. So in return, I'll help you create a website because you're an artist and I'll help you, you know, kind of get your like artistry thing off the ground and like help you create like that as a career. And he's like, okay, fine, you can help me with my website in exchange. So they kind of like start helping each other one-on-one -on -one, and it's like a really cute romance that way. I really loved just all the different conversations in this book. Their romance, I preferred it more as a friendship, like I said in the beginning. I thought that they, they really did start off as friends. They really started off as people just kind of like getting along with one another and as they like, you know, kind of developed and became more and more vulnerable as well, um, Redford, went through a very emotionally abusive and actually physically abusive relationship in his past. So he's very afraid to open up again to anyone. He doesn't want to go through that. And he has a lot of PTSD, honestly, from it. And so whenever he's around Chloe, he's just constantly afraid of like things going wrong and he shuts down very easily. Similarly, Chloe, she lost all of her friends when she was diagnosed with her chronic illness. And, you know, people left her. They didn't want to stay around with her. They couldn't deal with, you know, her sickness, her illness, and she just doesn't trust anyone now to stay. And so they're very distrusting people of one another, and that's a huge conflict for them about this book. So while they do have this huge romance, they they just butt heads. Um, and I definitely think like it was a really important exploration, is a very important book, but I just like didn't fully jive with it. You know, things were progressing very slowly, and then they kind of like suddenly took off, and then there was like a lot of back and forth between them, and I just I don't know like. It just ended up being like just a little bit above average for a romance. Next 3.5 star read is Wallflower Christmas by Lisa Claypass. This is book 4.5 in the Wallflower series. Um, 3.5, it's a novella. <laughs> Most novellas I rate are either a three or a four star. They're very rarely a five and they're very rarely a two. Like it's just, it just depends on the book. I really loved reading this. It's a great read after you've read the entire Wallflower series. It does take place during Christmas time. I actually think it'd be more fun to read it during Christmas than when I read it in July, but you know, it's all the same. It was cute. Yeah. The next book is my four star read. I only have one of them and that is So We Meet Again by Suzanne Park. This is a really great book from Suzanne Park. She has definitely really improved in her writing and this book is just very special. I devoured it in one day. One day I literally, and like, yeah, that happens with a lot of my books, but I didn't set out to actively finish this in one day. I just like read it so quickly and so easily that like it just happened. And I was like, hot damn. So in this book, we are following Jessie Kim and she has just been laid off of her Wall Street job. And when she was laid off, she ends up hearing some of her coworkers be like, well, she was overpaid for a woman anyway. And someone else was like, oh, it's a pity she's leaving. She was one of those typical like Asian worker bees. And she gets super, super pissed and like reams them out. And then she ends up moving back home to Tennessee to move back in with her parents. And she's very dejected over this because 
um, that's not where she wanted to be in life. And then to top it all off, um, her childhood rival, Daniel, is also back in town. And she's like, God damn it, like, he ended up going off and becoming a lawyer in Silicon Valley. Like, our Korean American community here in Tennessee, like, loves him. They idolize him. And, like, I was always pitched against him as a kid. And now that I'm back home, everyone's going to see me as, like, such a huge failure. So she's like, <laughs> she still is like, harboring that deep resentment towards Daniel. And so what ends up happening is Jessie ends up deciding to, you know, look into becoming an entrepreneur and she ends up deciding to relaunch her Korean cooking channel that she had started in college and kind of pursue a career in Korean cooking. And she ends up kind of doing this alongside her mom. Her mom kind of like ends up helping her out like on YouTube. And so it's kind of, you know, got to do with the struggles of her, you know, studying her own business and what that's like and the pressures of that. And then also, you know, kind of dealing with her family and the expectations that they put upon them. And also just like her experience as a Korean American in this community where people have like a lot of stigma towards everyone. And so, you know, her experience with that. And then, you know, there is her romance with Daniel because Daniel's actually like pretty in love with her, but she's like, so adamant about not being with Daniel and so there's a cute romance that goes on there but it's it's definitely like a subplot to Jessie's overall experience of this book you know with racism and sexism and kind of the idea of like Jessie has always just been overlooked she's always like you know put herself last so that other people can be helped instead and she's kind of getting to that point in her life where she's like I know my self-worth I know who I am and I'm not gonna let other people take that away from me. The comedy in this though is hilarious. It is so funny at times. I freaking loved it. And it was just like, it was so realistic and just so easy to read. And I just, I loved it. I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. Just don't go into it expecting it to be like a romance focused book because it's more about Jessie's own experience. And I think that it was just amazeballs balls. Now we're moving on to my 4.5 star reads, the first of which is Sleeping Around by Morgan Vega. So following Corey Reed and she's been in foster care her entire life and the only kind of constant she's ever had is her violin, playing violin. That's kind of where she's put her entire worth. No matter where she goes, she always has a violin with her. She's about to go off to college now. She's been at her latest foster home for a couple, like I think eight or something months. And she's quite comfortable there, but she doesn't view it as a home. She's always viewed the idea of going off to college as like finally escaping the foster care system as her way to, you know, finally have a place that is hers. And she's very excited to go to Harmony College because she's get to, she gets to go there on like this violin scholarship. She's gonna be part of the music school. It's gonna be all perfect. And the problem is she gets there on the very first day and she finds out, ooh, we messed up. We um actually didn't accept you into the music program because we, 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 we screwed up. But um, we also screwed up because when we didn't accept you into the music program, we didn't tell the regular college that you were still accepting to them. So we don't actually have a room for you. And so she ends up, you know, in like a bunch of different living situations throughout her first year. She's trying to keep it secret from her foster family and her caseworker so that she can stay at the school. And you know, there's just so much going on in her life. It just got, it got really sad because all she wants is a place to be. All she wants is to, you know, finally have some sense of purpose with her life and everything is going wrong. And I broke down at one point because everything just got so dark for her. And I was just like, oh, this girl, she just wants a love. She just wants a place to be that is hers and nothing is working out. And I, oh, oh, it really got to me. The only reason why I saw the four or five stars is that there is a romance in this book and it just wasn't fleshed out. It was more of like a friendship. And then suddenly it was like, JK, they're in love with one another. And I was like, oh, oh, what? So the romance was like, eh. it didn't need to be in there, but I loved everything else. Then we have She Who Became the Sun, which is by Shelley Parker Chan. This book is like Mulan meets the Poppy War with like a dash, a dash of A Song of Achilles. But basically it takes place during the end of the Mongolian dynasty into the beginning of the Ming dynasty. So you're following this girl and she was told from a young age that her prophecy was that she would be nothing, but her older brother was given the prophecy that he would achieve greatness. And when he ends up unexpectedly dying, she decides to assume his identity and so that she can achieve greatness. And so you're following her throughout her life as she kind of goes through these different processes to, you know, achieve this goal of hers. And she is genderqueer because, you know, as she is assuming her brother's identity, she begins to realize that she's neither male nor female, really. She kind of like goes through it, like really does depend just like what's going on as to who she is. And she does end up having this, you know, female female relationship later on that she kind of uh, ends up having. And then there's also this other 
POV that you end up following is kind of interesting. You start off just following the main girl's POV for like the first third of this book and then for the last two thirds you're introduced to another two to three POVs that you end up following. Um, one of which is another genderqueer character who is a eunuch um, who is kind of like her main rival and the kind of person who's like trying to kill her throughout this because they're on opposite sides of the war that is going on. So it's really interesting. Um, I gave it 4.5. I initially gave it a four star read but like a week later this book was still sticking with me. I was still thinking about it so I bumped it up half a star. But it is kind of difficult to get into because it's very dense with all the history that you're learning about like the Mongolian dynasty during this time and just like the different terminology and stuff like that. So this is very deeply steeped in historical stuff. But if you can kind of like push yourself through it, I blew through the second half. The second half was just amazing. Like once you really get like a foothold of what this world is and who the characters are, you fall in love with it. It is so awesome. And if you're like me and you really like watching those like old Chinese like um, historical like war movies with like you know all this like fighting and stuff like that you will definitely really love this because I love them so <laughs> yeah. Okay now to my four five star reads the first of which is going to be again The Magic by Lisa Claypes. I freaking love this book. This is the prequel novel to the Wallflower series. I highly recommend you start with it. So this one we're following the romance between Lady Aileen Marsden and John McKenna. John McKenna is the stable boy at her estate and the two of them have been inseparable since they were kids and as they got older they fell in love and they kind of like had this secret romance until one day her dad ends up finding out and he ends up forcing them apart and as a result Aileen ends up actually like being really rude to McKenna so that he doesn't come back because her dad's like if he comes back onto our land I will ruin him. Then we flash forward like 10 to 15 years and McKenna ends up coming back as a very wealthy American businessman and she is like oh my god like he's rekindling all these feelings for him like ever since he left like I've never loved anyone else but he is back with like a vengeance. He's like I'm going to ruin this girl like she broke my heart I've never gotten over this and so it's their like second chance enemies to love is romance but more like enemies on his side not on her side because she's like I still love you and he's like I hate you but do I really and I cried my eyes out reading this they have such a tragic Romeo and Juliet-esque romance it was awful to read about I was just like you tragic children I just wish you to be together but oh there was so much miscommunication there's a lot of miscommunication that goes on between them because they're trying to protect one another and it just like, oh, it tore at me. It tore at me. I love this. One of my favorite historical romances I have ever read. Then we have XOXO by Axie O. Oh. This is a YA romance that is a forbidden K-pop idol romance. So you find Jenny and she's a cello prodigy and she spends her nights working in her uncle's, um, shoot, what's it called? Karaoke bar. And one night while she's, you know, doing some work at the karaoke bar, she ends up running into this guy and they have like this whirlwind night together and then he disappears and like moves back to Seoul and she's like you know always been thinking about him and then one day her mom comes to her and her mom is like hey I need to go to Seoul for a couple months because my you know your grandmother my mother she needs surgery and she's sick and Jenny is like well can I come with you don't leave me behind like I want to see Seoul I want to see my heritage I want to meet my grandmother finally and you know maybe I'll run into the guy who I met a couple months ago and so she ends up moving to Seoul and ends up attending this um, performing arts boarding school and when she gets there she does end up running into that guy again it just turns out that he's actually the lead singer of this brand new debut k-pop group and she's like what the f and so they actually cannot have a romance because he's not allowed to date like that's just the rule for k-pop idols and so she's in love with him he's in love with her and there's like all these different things going on it definitely feels like a k-drama if you watch k-dramas you need 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 to read this if you're also a fan of mangas you need to read this like if you love any of that stuff you will devour this book i loved it to death i like had to force myself to put this down to go to bed because like, it was like three in the morning and i was like i need to wake up in three hours for work <laughs> i can't do this but it was so addictive Five out of five stars, my favorite YA contemporary romance that I've read in like forever and ever and ever. It's like at the top of my list now. I would easily reread this because I freaking loved it so much. Oh my God, like look at me. I, oh, it's so good, so good. Then we have It Happened One Summer by Tessa Bailey. I feel like everyone probably knows about this book by now. It's a Schitt's Creek inspired romance and it is hella steamy because it does have some, um, 
butt stuff in it. It's really steamy. You would not know, but it's Tessa Bailey. So this is like a really freaking hot book. But you're following Piper Ballinger. She's an era. She's a party girl. She has like all these followers on Instagram. And one day she ends up going a little bit too far and gets arrested. And her stepdad is like, that is it. I am cutting you off. I am sending you to go live in your mother's hometown for a couple of weeks and you need to get your life together. And she's like, you can't cut me off. You can't do this. And he's like, well, too bad. I am. You're going. So she ends up in this seaside town that, you know, is where her mom and her biological dad met. Her dad did pass away. He was a king crab fisherman and he, you know, died on the sea. He just went overboard and bye bye. Um, so she's back there. And what ends up happening is she ends up running into this sea captain named Brendan and, and right off the bat he's just like this girl does not belong here. If you've watched Shit's Creek she rocks up just like um Alexis does in that book where she is like all dressed to the nines does not look like she fits in there and they are just like this girl does not belong so they butt heads instantly but then they kind of like you know start this romance up between one another and Brendan did have a wife but she did pass away a couple of years ago and you know he's never really moved on since then but he meets Piper and she really spikes something in him and so it's their romance and I loved it it was so hilarious so funny so sweet and cute and also raunchy at times it was just perfection and you know another thing I really liked about this is you know everyone looks at Piper and they're like oh she's just like an airheaded heiress like there's really not that much substance to her and she's always being taught that so she's like kind of like begun to believe it herself but now that she's in this town she kind of like starts to find her purpose and her voice and you know realizes who she is and becomes so self-assured and I really love that plus she's like she's not afraid of her sexiness she's not afraid to be dressed to the nines she's not afraid to you know be girly and fun but also like get down and dirty like I loved her as a character she's so complex and so much to her and like her development over this book is just oh it's beautiful so I highly highly recommend it it is hilarious it is fun it is raunchy it is just like five stars and then last but certainly not least we have Twisted Games by Anna Huang this is the second book in the Twisted Quartet this is the second one that is out the third book comes out in January of next year but this is a romance between Princess Bridget and Reese who is her bodyguard it is a contemporary princess bodyguard romance she's like the princess of this very small kingdom in Europe and it's forbidden there is like a 10 year age gap between the two of them and I freaking loved it you got to see a lot of their banter in book one but the first quarter of this book overlaps with the last quarter of the first book which is why I think that it's kind of necessary to have read the first book because you'll miss a lot of the context that kind of goes on with everything but it's basically like you know their forbidden relationship because she ends up having to take the throne after her brother abdicates and so there's a lot of like political intrigue to do with this a lot of like sexy sexy times like this is hella smutty oh my god I loved love the sexy scenes in this way more than I loved them in the first book because the first book does have a degradation kink which is not my favorite thing to read about but this one has more of like the possessive alpha male and a lot of like spanking and things like that which is way more my vibe so really really love this this has like quickly become like one of my favorite romance series Anna Huang has quickly become a favorite romance author so if you do love your self-published romances if you do love your money romances definitely definitely check this series out okay so that's gonna be it this was a really long video to film because I'm just a bit of a mess, but it's fine. But I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, please like button down below. If you want to see more of me, please go to my channel. And until next time, thanks a bunch, everyone. Bye-bye.